Don Chaffee, director of several big pictures such as Jason and the Argonauts, One Million Years B.C., like uh, other members of the team, also regularly worked for television, directed most of the early prisoner episodes and all the location work in Port Merion. I was about to do another feature over in Ireland and Pat suddenly came along and said he'd got this idea and I said, great, good, take it, you know, that's fine, do what you like with it. And he said, no, I'd like you to direct um, uh, the first episodes to sort of set a style or whatever you like. And I said, great, no, no, no. And I just refused point blank and I went off over to Ireland and um, Pat and my wife, my late wife and daughter, we were all good friends at that time and uh, we still are, but I mean, we're friendly family-wise. And so he grabbed my daughter and gave her these scripts and said, get your father to read these. And uh, my daughter kept on trying, and finally she read them herself. And she came up with the, uh, she said, you've got to read these. She said, um, she said um, people, people are just going to, uh, she said, it's, they're compulsive, they're going to be compulsive viewing. And she said, I reckon you'll have 11 million people lo loving to hate you every Sunday night if you make these. It was so intriguing, I started to read them and called Pat, and Pat came across to Ireland where I was directing a picture with Don Murray. And uh, we, I agreed to do it. Pat's not an easy person, uh, as you probably know, to get on with, but he, at least he knows what he wants. And I have sort of some clear-cut ideas too. And uh, so, you know, by sitting down, and it, uh, there were some bitter arguments, but that's not here nor there. I mean, out of it came what I think is probably one of the best television series made, you know. Yes, um, now, Pat Jackson, veteran filmmaker, began in the GPO film unit in the 30s, met McGoohan 10 years before, the Prisoner when he gave him his first screen test ever. Directed four episodes of The Prisoner, including Schizoid Man. Man in a suitcase, I think it was. And uh, David Tomlin came over to see me and, and no, I think, no, I can't quite remember. I think Pat, yes, Pat asked me to come over to, to Well Street, MGM. He said, I got a proposition that might interest you. Then I went over to see him. And he showed me the location stills of Port Mary and, and the rough outline of the story, which wasn't absolutely clear then. And he said, would you be interested? I said, yes, I think I would, Pat, very interested indeed. But then I got involved in the Danger Man thing, in the uh, Man in a Suitcase thing. And then he sent me a script. Um, and uh, as one does, when one sent a script through the post, you hope it's going to be nice, that you can do it, in all conscious you can do it. And I tore it in the envelope and started to read Schizoid Man. And I read it through in one session. I was absolutely thrilled. I didn't know what the hell it was all about, mind you, but I thought it was fascinating. Absolutely wonderful idea, very interesting. I rang him up at once and said, Pat, I'd love to do it when. And so we, you know, the schedule was worked out. It was about 10 days' time. So down to Elstree I went for the first day's shooting. There was Pat, ready. Uh, and of course, one had to have one's plan worked out. You know, we had to get about five and a half to six minutes cut film every day. So you were doubling the cut film that you would do in a feature, yet the quality didn't have to drop at all. It had to look as good as a feature, even though we had to get twice as, mu as much. And off we went, and uh, that was successfully done, and then I did the other three for When one took the script, you read it, analysed it, uh, worked out your shooting plan, uh, how the artists were to move, and um, then you got on the floor and quickly bought in the scene, and everybody was happy and comfortable, off you went. And then the usual cover shots, and... Uh, no, no, I had no, no brief at all. You've just analysed it as a conductor would a score, and uh, off you go. Oh, I'd love to be able to say, yes, I saw the significance of this series, and that it was going to be the prestige series, and you could get a PhD at university writing a treatise on it. Absolute rubbish. I didn't at all. I took it as a job, and I was thankful that one could do it in, with conscience and do it with pride, and think this is a fascinating, fascinating project. I was more interested, really, in the fact that this, this scene now, from what I could tell, uh, to, um, to be an opportunity to present a rather more offbeat idea. And um, I'd had this idea about uh, what was happening to education and what is happening to education, frankly, that it is becoming um, a rote thing. My apologies, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to say a brief word about speed learning. It is quite simply the most important, most far-reaching, most beneficent development in mass education since the beginning of time. A marriage of science and mass communication, which results in the abolition of years of tedious and wasteful schooling. A three-year course indelibly impressed upon the mind in three minutes. Impossible? No, not impossible. Not now. Look what they did to me. What 
was the Treaty of Adrianople? September 1829. Wrong. I said what, not when. What was the Treaty of Adrianople? Wrong. I said what, not when. No, it doesn't matter. Of course I'm all right. By some indefinable quality, and it did represent an aspect of the 60s which is not so popular, the paranoia of the 60s. Um, it seemed to me that that was a period when a lot of people were realizing that uh, they were alienated from the political forces. The bomb was getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and while the Beatles were singing about love and uh, that sort of thing, uh, politics were getting rather nastier and nastier, and, and people felt less and less able to control them. Well, again, I have to be very careful, because it wasn't the sort of ideas that were being discussed in The Prisoner, but I think that was the ambience, that was the pressure. And that, uh, that was the sort of thing that Pat was aware of, not uh, as a politician, which he's not, but as a human being and a creative person. He was aware of these forces, and that's what came into the... Uh, there was a certain amount, I mean, uh, not madness, I wouldn't say madness, but uh, there was a certain schizoid aspect of the 60s, which this series actually put its finger right on. You just fill in your race, religion, hobbies what you like to read, what you like to eat, what you were, what you want to be, any family illnesses, any politics. Note. Prophecies and contemporary resonances in The Prisoner. Highly organized and sophisticated programs of systematic brainwashing. Use of hallucinatory drugs to obtain information. The village. Just look at Milton Keynes. Credit cards for money, leisure centers. Political systems which operate in increasingly concealed and all-powerful ways. Tampering with the mind. I'm inadequate. I'm inadequate. 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 Disharmonious. Disharmonious. I'm truly grateful. I'm truly grateful. Believe me. 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 Need I say more? Let's proceed. <laughs>